Welcome back to our study of the fundamentals of operating systems. This series of lectures is based on the book Operating Systems Concepts, 10th edition, by Abraham Silberschatz, Greg Gackney, and Peter Galvin, published by Wiley Publishing. Well, we're beginning the second module of our course. This module is on the process management system. In some textbooks, some authors will refer to it as the process manager. In our earlier introductory lesson, our overview lesson, we found out that a microprocessor, the CPU, can process one instruction at a time. One instruction at a time. And yet, in a multitasking or multi-user environment, we find that we have multiple tasks all running at the same time and one can simply switch back and forth between tasks or the system can switch between users. So the system appears to be working with multiple processes at the same time or it appears to be working with multiple users at the same time. Now how is this possible when a CPU can only perform one instruction at a time? Well that's what we're going to find out in this module. So let's get started. Early computers allowed only one program to be executed at a time. This program had complete control of the system and had access to all of the system's resources. Remember when I mentioned what happened when I sent a large amount of output to a printer years ago? I lost the computer because only one program could be executed at a time and that program was busy sending data to a very slow printer. In contrast, contemporary computer systems allow multiple programs to be loaded into memory and executed concurrently. This evolution required firmer control and more compartmentalization of the various programs, and these needs resulted in the notion of a process which is a program in execution. A process is a unit of work in a modern computing system. The more complex the operating system is, the more it's expected to do on behalf of its users, and the more important it is to protect those running processes from intruding on one another. Although the main concern of the operating system is the execution of user programs, it also needs to take care of various systems tasks that are best done in user space rather than within the kernel. Now we discussed this in the preliminary module. So a system consists of a collection of processes, some executing user code and others executing operating systems code. Potentially all these processes can execute concurrently with one or more CPUs multiplexed among them. In this unit we will learn what processes are, how they are represented in an operating system, and how they work. What should we call all the CPU activities? Early computers were batch systems, followed by the emergence of time shared systems that ran user programs or tasks. A batch system would execute jobs sequentially, one at a time, as if from a batch. Now even on a single user system, a user may be able to run several programs at one time, a word processor, a web browser, email software. And even if a computer can only execute one program at a time, such as on an embedded device that doesn't support multitasking, the operating system may need to support its own internal programming activities such as memory management. In many ways all of these activities are similar so we call them processes. Though we use the term processes the term job has historical significance. As much of the operating system theory and terminology was developed during a time when the major activity of operating systems was job processing. So in some instance we use the term job when describing the role of the operating system. For example when we use the term job scheduling 
when referring to the way the operating system determines which processes are allowed into the queue for use of the CPU. It would be misleading to avoid the use of the word job simply because the word process is now in style. As we've already learned, a process is a program in execution. The status of the current activity of a process is represented by the value of the program counter and the contents of the processor's registers. You remember our discussion of these things. The memory layout of a process is typically divided into multiple sections and will be depicted on an upcoming slide. These sections include the text section, which is executable code, the program counter, just, we just talked about that. The stack section, temporary data storage when invoking functions such as function parameters, return addresses, local variables, and so on. The data section, which contains global variables. And the heap section, which is memory that is dynamically allocated during runtime. The sizes of the text and data sections are fixed as their sizes do not change during a program runtime. However, the stack and the heap sections can shrink and grow dynamically during program execution. Each time a function is called, an activation record containing function parameters, local variables, and the return addresses is pushed onto the stack. When control is returned from the function, the activation record is popped from the stack. You remember our earlier discussion about push and pop? Push adds objects to the stack and pop removes them. Similarly, the heap will grow as memory is dynamically allocated and will shrink when memory is returned to the system. Although the stack and the heap sections grow toward one another, the operating system must ensure that they do not overlap one another. Remember that I referred to a memory manager earlier, or a memory management system if you prefer. We'll learn more about the memory manager later. Right now, we are talking about the process manager or the process management system. Our authors emphasize that a program by itself is not a process. A program is a passive entity, such as a file containing a list of instructions stored on a disk. In contrast, a process is an active entity with a program counter specifying the next instruction to execute and a set of associated resources. A program becomes a process when an executable file is loaded into memory. Two common techniques for loading executable files are double clicking an icon that represents the executable file or entering the name of the executable file on the command line. Although two processes may be associated with the same program, they are nevertheless considered two separate execution sequences. For example, several users may be running different copies of the mail program, or the same user may invoke many copies of the web browser program. Each of these is a separate process, and although the text sections are equivalent, the data, heap, and stack sections vary. You've done that, haven't you? Opened up several web browsers at once? Sure you have. It's also common to have a process that spawns many processes as it runs. Note that a process can itself be an executable environment for other code. The Java programming environment provides a good example. In most circumstances, an executable Java program is executed within the Java virtual machine. The JVM, as it's abbreviated, executes as a process that interprets the loaded Java code and takes actions on behalf of that code. In other words, the job of virtual machine is the program that's running and the process is the action of that virtual machine. 
as a process executes, it changes state. As you can see in this slide, the state of the process is defined in part by the current activity of that process. A process may be in one of the following states. New. In other words, the job scheduler is creating the process to run. It could be running. It means that the, it has the CPU and is performing its instructions. It may be waiting. In this case, the process is waiting for some event to occur, like an input-output device of some sort, say a printer. It could be ready. That means that the process could use the CPU if it could only get it. Or it could be terminated. That means it's finished. The states are found on all systems, although the names may vary, and some operating systems may offer some subcategories. It's important to realize that only one process can be running on any processor core at any time, even though many processes may be ready and waiting. The state diagram corresponding to these states is presented in this figure. Let's explore a simple example. Some systems may have multiprocessors with possibly multiple cores. Multiple cores, as you know, is like having multiple processors on a single chip. The states may be occurring on several of these cores at the same time. So to satisfy our goal of keeping it simple, let's limit our discussion to the states occurring on a single core. One or more jobs or processes may need service by the central processing unit, but only one can receive such a service at a time. Remember, I said only one process can be running on any processor core at a time, even though many processors may be ready and waiting to run, which means that the processes must be queued up, waiting their turn with the CPU. Which one gets the processor is determined by a number of ways, but for the moment, let's just say it's first come, first serve. So new process 4 is created, and it's ready for the CPU. Does it get it right away? Maybe not. Process 1, 2, or 3 may be used in the CPU, so process 4 gets added to the bottom of the ready queue. That's the queue that all processes that are ready for the central processing unit are placed in. The other processes in the queue must wait their turn to get the CPU. A process is not allowed to keep the CPU for as long as it wants. This would be annoying to the other processes as it is for me to stand in the line at the grocery counter and see the person in front of me holding a list full of coupons for the cashier. Get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. Later we'll talk about how the process manager deals with those processes that don't want to give up the CPU. For now, let's just say the process voluntarily gives up the CPU. Why would it do that? Well, for one thing, it might be finished. In other words, the process's state would be terminated. It might also be giving up the CPU because it needs the service from some other device, like a printer or a network interface. For our example, let's say it needs to print. In comes the device manager to do its thing. Does the process immediately start printing? Not necessarily. There may be something already being output to the printer. So the process gets placed in another queue, the wait queue. It's waiting for its turn at the printer. A printer cannot be shared either. When an output is sent, the printer does not take another one until the first is completely done. The process has been added to the end of the wait queue for the printer. In fact, there could be multiple waiting queues, one for each device. So our process has worked its way to the top of the printer's waiting queue and gets sent to the printer. Okay, so it's finished printing. Now what? Well, it's probably going to want the CPU again. Does it get it right away? Nope. It must sit in line at the bottom of the ready queue and wait its turn. Okay, so we see how all these states are handled. And we should also see that the protocols for dealing with multiple processes are very thorough. Now to be sure, there are several other players at work in this scenario. For example, some kinds of handlers must be involved in dealing with those other devices. 
Also, the process in midstream may have data loaded into several registers when it's interrupted. The current state of those registers must be stored until the process is once again given the CPU. We'll be covering all this in greater detail before we're done. Okay, I think that's a good start on our discussion of the process manager. So let's take a break here and take care of any other business you may have. And when you're ready, come on back and we will move on to lesson two on the process manager of the operating system.